Hello and welcome to AC Sisterhood Speaks. I am your host, Six Keys, joined by my co-host Lorena. Hey everyone. And our special guest today, Anouk Bachman. Hi, it's so nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Yeah, I'm super, super excited to, to join you for this podcast today. So thank you for having me. Anouk recently moved into a different position within Ubisoft, but she worked on the Assassin's Creed Transmedia team until 2019 and oversaw some launch projects on AC Valhalla as well. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I worked on the, the Transmedia team for Assassin's Creed, uh, indeed, uh, from AC3 and from 2012 to 2019. And then I joined the marketing, marketing team for Assassin's Creed Valhalla up to February this year when I joined a different, uh, different game team. And we're excited to hear more about your involvement in, in the games. But for starters, we'd love to hear a little bit about your background. Uh, how did you get into the games industry? And would you say this was a traditional career path? <laughs> I love that question because um, my path into the games industry was uh, a really bumpy road. Um, I mean, I'm, I might be dating myself, but but I went to college and university in, in Amsterdam. I'm from Holland, so I was born and raised in Holland and went to university in Amsterdam. I, I was already, I really wanted to work in games, but I had no idea how. And the games industry, there was no games industry in, in Holland at the time. Um, it was non-existent and neither were there clear paths in uh in college or university to to gear towards that so uh so i went into film and television studies at the university of amsterdam um but i worked with a really amazing professor who allowed me to write my papers my my undergraduate thesis uh about uh, directed towards video games and um so that was that was really awesome and it was really more of a like a philosophical humanities, like a cultural studies side of things, because at the time, you know, there was just not something available like uh, animation degrees or uh, level design degrees. They they just didn't exist yet, not for video games, not at the time, not then in Holland. So, um, so that kind of was my approach, and um, with that, I I got a scholarship to to study in San Francisco, and the entire reason for me to do that was besides uh, the fact that I was, you know, in love at the time with someone who, who was living in San Francisco, <laughs> definitely also has to be said, um, but a huge motivation to go and pursue my graduate studies there was uh, San Francisco was a hub, is still a hub for, for the games industry, and it already was, this is like, I think 2003 or four or something like that. And, um, I moved there and then being in San Francisco and studying there at the university, I, I got a chance to get into the GDC and, um, and other conferences like that and really learn a lot more about the games industry. And uh, I really wanted to work in it. I, I knew that. I just had no idea what kind of role I could have because I had no technical skills and um, nor any practical skills like animation or level design. Like I said, I couldn't get an education in that in, in Holland. So um, I realized through by going through the GDC that there were roles like producer roles, project manager roles. And I felt that could be a, a good fit for me because it fits well with my personality. I'm like very organized. <laughs> I like I like communicating. I like problem solving. So there was this kind of inherent interest in that. But um, after I finished my graduate studies in San Francisco, I had to leave the United States because my visa was going to end, a student visa. And my partner at the time, he was in the games industry and he could get a really great job at Electronic Arts here in Montreal. And uh, so we moved here in Montreal together. This is getting a like, really long story. I'm sorry. It's so complicated. <laughs> it's okay. Then we were in Montreal, and then I really wanted to, you know, I, I started applying for jobs, like in, in um, testing, you know, uh, translation, things like that. Uh, I just 
I was really keen, even though I had a graduate degree, just to, you know, start start from. I mean, I don't want to say bottom because that that's not right to talk about uh, testing as as a as the bottom. You know, that's just not accurate. But like an entry level job in testing, that's what I was looking for, and I I just couldn't get it. Uh, I was re rejected a lot, and um, yeah, and eventually, and I'm really open about this. Was like my partner had had a really um, he had a good position at Electronic Arts and he eventually arranged an interview for me. And, um, you know, I, I rejected that at first because I wanted to make my own career by, by myself and get in on my own merits, but it just wasn't possible. And um, he arranged the interview and after that, the ball was rolling and I, and I got in and got a job. But um, I, I do like to think that while he set up the interview, after that, I, I was able to to take care of of my own, but um, so that's that's kind of how it went, and uh, so definitely not traditional and very hard. I had to move out of, I had to leave my country, um, move across the world, and then again in order to make it happen. It sounds like you really had to go through a lot of changes to get to where you are. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very uh, very used to. Um, to like throwing my life around in order to to figure out what to, what I want to do and where to go, you know. But it wasn't easy, no. But so you eventually uh, ended up at Ubisoft, and you worked on the Assassin's Creed franchise for ten years. Yeah, I I did. Um, my first job in games was at EA, but then I joined Ubisoft. Yeah. So what, what kind of positions did you hold on the AC franchise while you were on it? And what did that entail? Um, so I worked at, at Electronic Arts for a few years. That was, that's where I started in games and uh, eventually left and joined Ubisoft. And um, after a while there, in 2012, I was asked to join the brand team uh, on Assassin's Creed. And uh, that was when Assassin's Creed 3 was in production. This was like uh, early, like in January or February of 2012. And um, my role there was, was really hybrid at first. It was like, uh, I mean, it was, was on Transmedia, but it wasn't called Transmedia then. It was just called the brand team. And uh, my job was, was then to um, start working on products like licensing products, you know, like... Uh, uh, T-shirts, mugs, like lots of things like that, but also um, like the biggest project I handled that was the art book for Assassin's Creed 3. Uh, so that really sparked like my passion and interest for publishing because I was already really into that anyway. And um, from there on, over the years, over many, many years, I was basically taking on all of the publishing projects for Assassin's Creed. And as the department changed from like the brand team into the transmedia team, I kind of naturally became the one responsible for publishing. And uh, and I was responsible for publishing. So all the books, the comics, um, even even audio books, things like that for uh, un until, uh, until I left transmedia for marketing in 2019. That's when I joined, uh, I dedicated myself to the marketing team from uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So yeah, so about nine and a half, ten years, yeah. That's a really long time. It, it is. <laughs> it's really crazy to think about. Yeah, it's like, uh, wow, a decade almost. Ubisoft has a number of transmedia projects released over various mediums. When you were part of the transmedia team, how did these projects start? Do projects start at Ubisoft or are they pitches from external partners? So I can only speak from my own experience, which is, you know, which, which runs like in the transmedia team uh, until 2019, you know, because I think, you know, the transmedia team is, is doing, has done some really amazing things since I left as well. So, um, so I can't speak for their processes anymore, but uh, when I was working on Assassin's Creed, uh, the publish. Uh, you know, in charge of publishing. Um, basically, it, it would go both ways. Like we would have 
a lot of ideas for products coming from from us from a, a business point of view but and a creative point of view within ubisoft but also sometimes we would work with an external partner and they would they would come with us with some really fresh perspective and ideas so um and often often the end results would be like hybrid you know um so for instance at some point we worked on um a book we wanted to do a novel with christy golden she she's a, a pretty well-known writer now especially she did a lot of spin-off novels for blizzard for um world of warcraft i love love her work and uh so eventually we wanted to do a book with her and uh, she came to visit us in in montreal and we had a few like uh, time periods and settings that we were really open to explore that we were really interested to explore in a new novel like a standalone novel and uh with her we just kind of sat in a room for for a few days you know and looked at these different time periods of what they could mean and she naturally gravitated towards the the time period of uh, Jeanne d'Arc or Joan of Arc and then we can we really collaborated really deep into that so that's 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 a really good example, I think, of, of how the collaborations often went. Like we offered, we offered like several potential playgrounds to a writer, to an author, and they would kind of go into that playground and, you know, it's a weird analogy, but like build their own castle, so to say, you know, um, with, with our guidance, of course, because like the lore of the brand is, is pretty complicated. So we had to really, uh, really help out with that but but in the end it, it, we always wanted you know the goal was always to to have creatives whether it's writers or artists artists to have their own voice and their own uh you know style and what they what they bring to something so i think that's a really good example of how how these projects work at ubisoft you know i think it, it worked like that as well with uh, uh with bigger publishing partners like uh, scholastic with whom we did the young adult novel series um they were really open to to hear from us what we felt you know was still like uh, had a lot of room in the brand to grow to play in like but its settings but then we scholastic hired a writer with us uh, matthew kirby who who brought so much so much to that and came up with his own ideas and we would just give feedback like okay how how would it fit within the Assassin's Creed lore and uh, and again like not not spell anything out for him but really give him uh, yeah I think you know I like to say that that give him give him that playground you know like here use use that go nuts uh, so I think that's that's really uh, it's really a collaborative process so and I think I would I would feel pretty safe to say that that's probably still how that goes I'm just gonna add that heresy is still one of my favorite standalone novels uh, I particularly enjoyed that project. So, yeah, that was that was a good call. That's so great. Yeah, I I really love it personally as well because I I, I mean I especially I adore Christy Golden as a person and as a writer. I always really loved her World of Warcraft novels. Um, I read all of those before I even working with her. You know, so it was funny when when she came to Montreal. I was a bit starstruck. You know, because. <laughs> Um, and she did such a great job, and I really love what she what she did with Joan of Arc and um, you know and the modern Templars, and it was such a complex setup, you know. And she just completely embraced that and, and came up with so many cool ideas. So I'm so glad you enjoyed that because it's uh, you know it's it's maybe not the most well known one. I think you know a lot of people know the spin off novels from the games better than the the standalone ones, but. Uh, uh, so I'm really happy to hear that you love that one. Heresy is one of those novels that I most want to read, but I don't think there's an audio version of it, unfortunately. I don't think so, no. No, I mean, we, and I know we didn't do an audio. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Yeah, because I've sometimes looked into them, and I think the only one that I've seen, maybe there are more, but I remember the second book, in Matthew Kirby's uh, YA novels, 
that one has an audiobook, but not the first one. <laughs> oh my god, really? Yeah, it's it's I, weird. I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah, that is odd, and it's it's kind of a shame, indeed. Um, I mean, I'm not in the team anymore, but I, yeah. I, should, I should write my my friends, you know, because I can obviously still very close with the team. Um, to ask about that, yeah, because uh, the YA novels, like again, Ma Matthew Kirby as well. He's he was such a joy to work with. You know, he's such a great writer and um, such a great person. Like uh, he brought so much to the to the YA novels. You know, like his his insight. Like he works at a school, a high school, and uh, you know, uh, psychology as well. And he has such a great insight into the world of of teenagers. You know. Like what he brought to that was was really something like you know it's rare you know to be to find a writer who also has that experience of actually working with teenagers, um and kind of knowing knowing what what's happening in their world you know. I know that we have a few fans of of his novels on the on the Discord server. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Yeah, he's he's such a great person, and you know maybe like. I mean, I'm not making suggestions, but it would be like you could talk to him. Like he's he's very approachable. Like he's such a great person. Um, he uh, he brought a lot of diversity to those novels, the YA novels. You know, like uh, to for him, he he brought you know Sean, the the character Sean in in the YA novels, who is a character who lost his ability to walk uh, in a car accident and then he experiences the memories of an ancestor of his, a Viking ancestor. So he gets to experience what it is like to fight, to run again. And he, his struggles with that, you know, um, coming back to his body in, in, from out of the animus. And um, I, just, I just love how, how he portrayed that without going too complex and too dark, you know, still keeping it an Assassin's Creed novel. But not not ignoring the emotional complexity and impact that that would have, you know. And uh, as well as with with the the sister and brother, uh, the African American teens who who experience the period of the race riots in New York through the animus and God, you know, like <laughs> that. That's like I when he proposed that I I wasn't so sure, you know, like is this safe for us to tackle you know or are we like in terms of like how how, how are we going to represent that in a way that's that's respectful and true and still an assassin's creed novel and i i, th I do think he, he pulled that off really well without without trying to diminish anything or um or make it a, make it like an, a spectacle that it wasn't you know I don't, know, I don't know if I'm using the right words here. I just really respect what he did with that. <laughs> really making me want to read it. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think one of the reasons I was initially attracted to Assassin's Creed as a franchise is the ability to kind of tackle some of these more like difficult topics because you have so much freedom to go anywhere in history and history has so many kind of dark chapters in it. Um, I think just to... I, I love this topic, but I, I want to make sure that we're able to get to other questions as well. Um, so I guess this is kind of piggybacking off of some of like the the content you've told us about. Like it's such a there's so much potential. There's so many areas you can explore. When you have so much content to choose from within the franchise, what are some of the considerations the team makes when deciding which projects to pursue? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's a really good question. And so, I mean, one of the first considerations is, of course, the audience. You know, like the the audience for the YA novel, who is your core audience, um, you know, for the comics, for the games, like we, we have a lot of uh, market research in at Ubisoft that does a really good job helping us understand different audiences. So, um, so that's, that's really important. And I think that applies to whether it's publishing or transmedia or the games, you know, it's, you always want to think who is your audience. Um, because you yourself might not be your audience, right? Um, then I think indeed the considerations is exactly exactly what you mentioned is is like the opp opportunity to offer different perspectives. Like for publishing, we would we would look at like the perspectives that the game the games offer the characters, and then look at um, 
you know, for, for Unity, for instance, like, oh, we really wanted to do a novel from Elise's perspective um, because it, it wasn't featured in the game. Like, her character was in the game, of course, but, like, the, the, novel, the novel offered an opportunity to uh, see things through her eyes, her thought processes. And then, there, of course, there's exactly like you said, there's the unexplored stories, um, like time periods that haven't been explored before, like what we did with Heresy is a good example with the Joan of Arc, but also with the, the comics for Origins, where we, we followed Aya into Rome and, uh, and her meeting Brutus and uh, eventually, you know, following her to the death of, of Cleopatra. So, so those are the considerations, really. I would say, yeah, I got the audience, you know, the, the different perspectives based on the existing games and, and the completely unexplored stories as well. And you've also talked about how collaborative this entire process is. And I understand that you've had a chance to work with a few community members on transmedia projects in the past. Can you tell us about some of these past partnerships and how they came about? Yeah, we, I worked on uh, a few guides, encyclopedia guides for Assassin's Creed, and these are really complex projects um, because you're digging into, by then it was already like, oh, I don't know, more than 10 years of lore, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, so that was a huge, huge challenge. And... The, the thing is also like, uh, you know, some of the lore is, is also sub subject to, to different perspectives, you know, like I was like to use the analogy is like e even history is like what we know of history is uh, not necessarily facts, you know, it's, it's point of views, you know, like I think even some things in the, in the lore of Assassin's Creed can be seen like that, you know, it's like it depends on, on, on um, the eye of the beholder. Um, so when, I, when we were working on, on these guides, I think it was very early on that we were like, okay, well, there, there's this group of people, you know, like access the animus who are doing these crazy in-depth analysis and, uh, you know, explanations of the lore and, um, you know, people who work on the, the wiki, which is incredible, right? Like their, their eye for detail. Uh, so I'm like, well, we, we should like involve these people, you know, like because at some point, like I'm working on it, a writer is working on it, and we we have a lot of great internal resources. But um, are we missing something? You know, and if anybody can spot if we're missing something, it's them. And they did, you know, they <laughs> so we we involved them, you know, um, and they did point out a few things and ask some really good questions. Where I was like, oh my god, uh, you know, some real real hard questions. So that, that was really awesome. It was a really great process. And, you know, some other collaborations are, um, I worked on some art collaborations on the comics, you know, like, um, I was really lucky that we were able to work with some amazing uh, artists from the community, like Valeria Favoccia and Sunset Again, um, among others. Um, they really, their art, their fan art really stood out to us. So when at some point we needed an artist, for instance, for the Reflections miniseries, the comics, um, we had already worked with Valeria for, for a few covers at that time, for Uprising, I think. And uh, we really needed an artist for the interiors as well. So at some point we were like, wow, we, well, you know, maybe Valeria could do the interiors. And um, I asked Rafael Lacoste, our brand art director, what he thought of that. And he was like, yeah, she's super talented. Let's definitely let's do it. And he was also really excited by the idea to have a, a community member, you know, like, like somebody who is an artist and a fan uh, work on these comics that were pretty special to us. So, um, so working with Valeria was a real, real pleasure. And I think for me personally, what made me really quite emotional about that was that uh, one of the issues in Reflections showed uh, Connor's daughter, Ioniode, and she brought her to life, you know, like she gave her a visual and a visual identity. And um, to me, that was really, really special because it's, it's such a special character to me to, to show her. And we had to work closely um, on our side. We work closely with 
you know, um, cultural advisors to make sure that uh, Ioniade was named correctly and depicted correctly. Uh, and Valeria just just followed up with that so well. So um, so that was really special. And uh, Sunset again, she did uh, some amazing covers as well. So yeah, so that was was really really cool that that to get that collaboration done. Uh, so there have also been community Easter eggs in transmedia in the past. Uh, most notably, most of us are aware of a character being named after Kulpreet, who was um, appeared in the Assassin's Creed Underworld novel. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, how this came about? Yeah, that was it was really cool. I I think you know, um, yeah, that was indeed for the the, the novel uh, based on on Syndicate or like the spin off of Syndicate, um, following the tale of of Henry Green to India and um, and the past there. And yeah, we had this this female character, a uh, female assassin in India and. Um, we did We needed a name for her, and uh, Kopreet was was pretty active as a fan already back then. And it was was actually um, in the author was like uh, you know he was aware of her as well, and we talked about it and about you know a good name, a good authentic name for for this character. And uh, so we were like, oh yeah, well you know what about Kopreet and. I was like, yeah, I mean, can we, can we do that? <laughs> you know, could we? And I think, I think it was Gabe Graziani who helped us reach out to Kilpreet to see if that was okay. Um, to, you know, to see if that was, if that was good with her. And uh, uh, because, you know, like, I, I wasn't sure because like, the thing is like the, the, I wanted to name that character after her because, but Kilpreet, like the character in, in the novel, she dies. And uh, I was like, oh gosh, is it, is it too creepy, you know? <laughs> so luckily she, you know, our, our Kilpreet didn't, didn't take it that way. I mean, she, she dies, but she dies. Like, she's super badass, right? So, um, so I, I'm really glad that she was, uh, she, she thought it was as cool as, as we did, you know, just like, Naming naming this character in in honor of of Kilpreet. So um, yeah, so that's that's how that went, and uh, I'm still super happy we were we were able to do that. You know, I thought it was a neat detail. I I read the novel, so I noticed it like right away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really nice, and you know, it's also just such a beautiful name too, right? So I was like, okay, can't can't beat that. Are there any other community Easter eggs that you can tell us about? Um, I, I really didn't work much on, on Easter eggs at all, to be honest. Um, so I, can't, I don't really have any other stories. <laughs> I think, you know, we put, we put a lot in, in the comics that are just like references to within AC, you know, but uh, community Easter eggs, yeah, no, not really. Some fans have mentioned the uh, some some of the more prominent community members have mentioned that there are some familiar looking characters sometimes in the comic covers and stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know if oh, those yeah. were intentional, but it's nice to imagine that they were at least. Oh, okay. You can you mention? Can you name some examples? So I haven't haven't followed that. I think uh, Shadow Marcus uh, Marco. I think he said that there was like an animus researcher in modern day in one of the comics that looked. <laughs> You know, curiously familiar. <laughs> oh yeah, I think. I mean that. Honestly, I haven't. I haven't read the comic, so I'm not sure which one. But uh... I mean, ha having having been in the comics, that would be a coincidence because we we can't use likeness in general. Oh, interesting. You know? Yeah. So so likeness is generally a, a coincidence. Um, so, but yeah, I mean. At, at the same time, I'm like, I'm sure there's like inspiration here and there. You know, it's just I'm I'm not aware of, of anything deliberate. Well, it's still my head canon anyway. <laughs> exactly. We wanted to also talk to you about, you know, the challenges of last year, in particular COVID. Uh, when the COVID pandemic broke out in early 2020, how disruptive was the initial scramble to move to remote work? 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good and relevant question. It's been now, oh, gosh, it's been now 15 months since the pandemic broke out and it was crazy, right? Uh, it, it, it came here in Montreal. It became really real here in, in March. It was right after spring break. I remember because I traveled to Holland and I came back and I spent like three days at the office and all of a sudden everything was shut down. And I kind of knew it was coming because I traveled from Holland and Belgium where the, the pandemic was already becoming much more real than it was here. And um, so I traveled back already having this fear in my heart. And sure enough, uh, a few days later, we all had to go home. Uh, schools are closed. Everything's closed. So I, I would say it was really disruptive on a personal level. But within like days, weeks, um, the Ubisoft IT department and the logistics departments just set everyone up like every single person to work from home so i think that's a huge feat like they deserve medals for that like i don't i genuinely don't understand how they were able to pull that off like it was um so it was actually quite minimal within within the literally days for some people weeks you know a week or two we were all up and running like no problem so that was that was crazy smooth, but yeah, on a personal level, it was of course a bit different. You know, big deal. There's lots of people um, who all of a sudden were home with their children, or you know, uh, like it's different difficult situations. You know, you're also a mother and have a young child who had to complete schooling from home. What sort of additional challenges did you have to face, and did you find that you had enough support? during the pandemic to manage both work and home life? Yeah, that's, that's also a really good question. My, my son, um, he's, he's eight and a half now, but when the pandemic started, he was seven. Um, he's in, he was in the middle of school indeed, and all of a sudden he's, he's home and, and it's this crazy situation. So for me, it was not just about needing to homeschool my son. It was more about making sure that he's okay you know like that he feels safe that he feels that whatever is happening to the world uh that that he's going to be taken care of like i felt that was a much higher priority for me than making sure that he does his french dictate you know or does his math like obviously later on that had to be done but at first in the first couple of weeks my priority was like how is he experiencing this as a seven-year-old like he he is old enough to understand what's happening he's old enough to be scared um but too young to maybe you know completely wrap his head around it so how do we deal with that so um so that was really my priority at the time and i'm really lucky that you know my son has basically four parents not basically has four parents you know he has his dad is stepmom his stepdad and me so really really lucky that he's surrounded with the with incredible support um but for me you know that that was uh so, so for me it was like when he's home with me i don't i can't just spend eight nine hours at my desk working every day putting him in the living room to play video games or to draw or something and be by himself and you know and and expect him to be okay like it's it's that wasn't real so ubisoft was to me it was like really amazing that they let us take time off for that um you know people who needed that not just not just to take care of kids because of course you know there's people who don't have to take care of kids but have to take care of others or themselves uh so we were given a, like a special time code so to say for for our work where we could uh could have time off as as we needed to take care of ourselves and um for a period of time, you know, for until the schools were open again. I think that was absolutely essential. Like I, I definitely used that. I felt like that way I could use, could spend a few, few hours during the day with my son, just dedicate my time, go to the park with him, explain, you know, make him feel safe, make him feel good and also take care of myself, you know, what's happening here. And I think in the end, I didn't, didn't really lose much time or productivity at work because um, cause that really helped like feeling able that feeling that we had that flexibility and support, um, from, 
from the workplace. And uh, that was how we managed that. I think, interestingly enough, when um, it, it, was, it was a little bit harder when I actually did try to do schooling with him, you know, I'm really not a teacher. So <laughs> I was really happy that the schools opened again uh, after a while. But um, yeah, it, it, was, it was a really, uh, it was really hard and I was really tired, but I also felt like my colleagues at the time, on the Great Valhalla, you know, the colleagues in the marketing team uh, who, who did not have families to take care of, at some point I, I, I would confide in them like, okay, hey, I'm having a really hard time like managing everything here. Like I, I worry about my son, you know, I want him to be okay. I need to spend time with him, but I, I need to complete this task. And, but I'm really stressed. And they would just be like, well, if it's too much, you, you just like, you know, pass it on to us. Like, so they really stepped up. And, um, and in the end, I didn't need to pass anything to anyone else. It was just feeling, feeling that they were there, you know, as colleagues, understanding my situation feeling that I could take the time during the day to take care of my son uh, was absolutely essential to all of our health, like mental health, professional health, everything. And, uh, and in the end, I think just having that support in place made it so that my work was actually barely impacted in the end. It does sound really good and, and important that you have that support network. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, I was, I feel very, very lucky with that. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things I know to be said about Ubisoft, but, um, but I, I felt like that really, uh, that, that was a big deal, you know, to have that, have that support. And, and of course, you know, I'm super lucky that, uh, that I have such a great co-parenting relationship. So my son wasn't with me full time. Like he has, uh, he has a dad and a stepmom who are just, uh, you know, we were very super close. So. That was, was lucky. I know that that's not the case for everyone. Yet. Did the pandemic derail any plans that your team initially had for the AC Valhalla launch? And if so, how quickly was the team able to rally and change direction? It, it actually it didn't impact the launch, really. Uh, I, I think, you know, like we were, we had the CGI trailer. Uh, so, sorry, there the, was the announce that... <laughs> That wasn't impacted, the announcement. Um, like we had the CGI trailer ready. The launch itself, um, yes and no. I think when it comes to marketing, like what was completely derailed is every live event. <laughs> so, you know, we, we didn't have E3, we didn't have Gamescom, we didn't have like the press events that usually surround the launch of a game like Valhalla. So those were, those were, completely derailed and then other things were not derailed at all you know uh you know did did the pandemic impact the development team yeah of course you know like i think it would be inhumane to to think that it didn't but i think in the end like the team nailed it you know like the launch they nailed it but on a marketing from a marketing side and pr side like we couldn't do any live events like there's no live demos uh, there's no events where you showcase your game there's no um press event so uh we all of us had to extreme like immediately pivot to finding ways to send um you know to build the demos of the game for for press to play remotely and we had to like set up uh remote like live press press events every all the interviews had to be done um digitally and remotely so that was crazy and um that was definitely a huge learning experience and i think in the end we all had quite a lot of fun with that because it's it i think when when a global circumstance forces you to innovate and do everything radically different from how it's been done before uh i don't know i i i found some enjoyment in that like in terms of like it's a real crash course in learning learning how to how to handle that um but i do i do really miss and i think everyone did we really miss the the live events you know like going to gamescom or having 
you know, having like meeting, meeting you, you know, like fans in person, uh, seeing people play the game in person. I think that's something that uh, you can't compensate for. So I, I you know, that, that still kind of makes me sad, you know, like that we never got to have that for Valhalla. And I think, um, you know, it's a shame. And I, I'm really happy we have at least, um, you know, we have social media and everything to, you know, for, for good, for better or for worse. But uh, yeah, I, I think I think that was that. That's the one thing that that I think everybody was bummed out about. It was like the lack of like seeing seeing our fans, our community members of Assassin's Creed in person, enjoying the game. You know, that's that, that's priceless. So all these challenges aside, the team did manage to have a very successful campaign. Uh, are there are there any campaign beats or collaborations that you are particularly proud of? I mean, I'm I'm. I'm proud of of a lot of things i think i'm most proud and it's gonna sound cheesy but i'm just most proud of having worked with with this dev team on a game who, who managed to ship a game like this in the circumstances that they were in under the pressure that they were in um you know in the circumstances i mean like in every way you know like like whether it's the pandemic or you know, events that happen in the press around Ubisoft, like, like it's incredible. It's the dev team really, like, working with people like that is is uh, is an insane experience, and I'm very proud to have been been part of that. Um, I think in terms of of the marketing campaigns, like, I worked. I mean, I I, I didn't, I wasn't the lead uh, project manager on the CGI, the trailer, but I was, I was involved with it. I, I, I really helped out a lot on it. So, um, that really was, was an amazing trailer and, uh, Digi did a fantastic job. And I think when the trailer with female Ava came out with, with, you know, that special soundtrack, uh, it just, I'll never forget that feeling, you know, and also how the dev team felt about that was really, really beautiful. Um, I think for me personally, I've worked on, on, uh, all of the visuals, you know, all the, uh, the high resolution, the character visuals, the the landscape visuals. I worked with artists very closely on those, and and seeing the team, uh, seeing the community get really excited when we would like show Basim or um, you know or Valka, like art art of her, and like people base their their cosplay on that. That's really stuff that hits hits home, you know. And uh, I also worked closely with uh, on an artwork with uh, the artist Gabs, a Polish artist, Gabs. Uh, Gabs is extremely talented. He's he's done a lot of crazy art, and we we collaborated with him on uh, posters. And I don't think they're very widespread in terms of how well known they are, but like the, as visuals, you know. <laughs> but that was. It was a real dream collaboration to work with an artist like that very closely. So, um, yeah, so those are some real, real highlights. And I think, I think the biggest highlights are, you know, when, for me personally, when I worked on, on the visual very long, very close with the artists and, and then you see the community embrace that visual, like whether it's as for cosplay purposes or they use it as a wallpaper or, you know, you see it come in press and everything. That's, uh, that's really great. I can confirm that the cosplay community was especially excited for Velka. I, I've definitely seen yeah. a couple out there. I've seen some crazy impressive. cosplay. Yeah, I know. I know. We we all look at that. You know, it's it's wow. It's mind blowing. Still, I'm still waiting for the Bossium cosplay to roll out. <laughs> yeah. So so it sounds like it's been quite a year, um, and just to kind of look outside of VPSoft a little bit. The gaming industry as a whole has been scrutinized for enforcing unhealthy work cultures and not encouraging work-life balance. What sort of lessons would you like to see the industry learn from the past year? And what forms of support do you think are most beneficial in helping devs maintain a healthy work-life balance? Um, that, that's an amazing question and one that I'm very, very passionate about. Like as, uh, you know, I've, I've been in the games industry for 13 or 14 years now. Yeah, 13 or 14 years. And uh, I have gone through crunch in the past and I've had a burnout in the past, like a long time ago. Um, 
very long time ago. That was before I joined Assassin's Creed. Uh, so, so I've I've been through that experience and um, also ha- faced the, the realization that if I wanted to stay in this industry and be healthy mentally, physically, in every way, uh, I needed to set some really clear boundaries and and manage manage my work life balance. And I think inherently a, a company needs to support support that you know so that people don't feel like they have to fight for a work-life balance but it's it's their right and i think i think ubisoft overall has been really really good with that in general um i think you know is there are still periods that are tough of course i think as a company ubisoft does recognize or at least in my personal experience i can't speak for everyone you know um because there's so many so many people um you know they who have their own experiences but my experience at least though for over 10 years at ub is that um they they do really respect that need for work life balance and i think they do realize um that for a lot of people like if you want to have people who are senior in a company or in the games industry uh you can't burn them out you know <laughs> like because they will leave or they will quit. Like whether it's the games industry or the company, it's like uh, I think there is a real business case for work-life balance in terms of like it's it's good for a company, it's good for business, it's good for the games industry. If your people do not crunch or very do very you know little overtime, and if the over overtime is done, that it's like for a good reason um, in a in a moment in people's lives that that they can and want to do it um because out of, otherwise there is no longevity you know and for me uh yeah for me personally work-life balance it means like yes indeed i i do my work i do it in a certain amount of time and if that is not enough then um then i need to talk to my manager right and generally managers are open then to to see like okay what's what's the problem here is it is it the way things go? Is is it like the pipeline? Is is there miscommunication or are the expectations maybe that you have over yourself too high or uh, or is it um, or is the scope too much? You know, and and then let's adjust it. So for me, the the experience has been really open for that. I think the gaming industry as a whole, you know, a few things that I, I'm particularly passionate about is is like health insurance that covers mental health. You know, that covers therapy, that covers things like ergotherapy uh, that that covers things that help people manage their emotional and mental health uh, at work and in their personal life, which is, you know, interconnected for a lot of us, especially with work from home. And uh, UB has has made really good strides in that, in, um, in, you know, promoting, promoting that at work. Like over the years, they've increased their support a lot when it comes to, uh, to helping helping that uh, with providing those kind of services or helping people get access to those services, um, I think I do think there there's you know a real challenge with the sheer size of of games, you know triple A games uh, they're they're massive you know there's there's so much there's so much that needs to be done and uh, I don't necessarily have an answer to how to how to make a game that's so huge with a huge amount of people within five years and not ever have overtime. You know, I don't necessarily have an answer to that, but I do think uh, in my personal experience in times where, you know, I've had times where I do overtime mostly because I choose to, because I want to. And then there's times where where I'm like, you know, I can't do it. And I've always, uh, always felt really supported. Like I never really felt cornered. To do that then and, and i would like i would like other people to feel the same way you know across the industry so i know it's not uh, it's not always the case so i'm I, it makes me really sad when people write stories and it's not at ub but i i do read it like uh, maybe maybe it's not in canada even because we have uh, social health care but like when people are like okay i have to do overtime otherwise i might lose my job and then i lose my health insurance and like oh my god you know um so uh that's that's not a great way to 
to be in a creative industry, but I, I know it happens all the time. But um, I think, you know, more people are speaking up online, on social media. People are less afraid to, to say what they think. You know, I personally, I'm very open about mental health. You know, I have dealt with a lot of issues like of, of physical health and uh, mental health. And I've never felt afraid to speak up about that, to share about that. And, um, and I've always felt supported at work as well. So I'm, uh, my, my experience has been pretty positive, but yeah, it, it, at the same time, I also really set my boundaries and I, I do feel that in an ideal world, it should people shouldn't have to set boundaries in order to have a healthy work-life balance. Like they should be in an environment that inherently supports that. Just want to say that I've, I've been really appreciative over the years of you being so open about your struggles uh, on social media. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I mean, the thing is like, for me, there is, um, you know, when I speak about anxiety or, you know, my, my own health, health issues, like I've had some really, really terrible things happen to my health over the years and, um, and I'm good, but like, for me, like speaking up about that, because the thing is, I felt really lonely at times. And I was like, this is not right because I know that there's millions of people experiencing the same thing, whether it's, you know, I spoke up about miscarriage. I spoke up about anxiety. I'm like, I am one of many 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 and how ridiculous is it that you should you know worry about speaking up about that like it's i mean but you don't have to go in, in details you know that's that's up to the individual but i just felt like you know i felt very lonely and as soon as i started saying like hey this is what i'm going through there's like so many others you know uh so and and for me as well like i have no um you know, for me, when I speak or post about these things, it, it doesn't hurt me. I don't feel, um, you know, there's nothing anybody could say to me that could make me, that could hurt me on, that, on those subjects, you know? <laughs> like, so I feel like if I'm in that position of, of strength, then it's almost like, um, I wouldn't say my duty, but, you know, I feel like I should speak up because I'm, I don't feel vulnerable. I'm not I'm not a vulnerable person when it comes to these subjects. You know, you can say whatever to me and I, like on those subjects, I'm very confident, even though they were very painful periods in my life and, uh, and still cause me grief. Um, there's nothing anybody could really say to hurt me. So I'm like, okay, I'm in that position so I can speak up so that other people don't feel who might go through the same thing and are um, more vulnerable that they don't feel alone you know so that's that's kind of the motivation why i'm open about these things on, on social media and I, honestly i've received so many sweet like i've never received anything negative like I've, I've only ever received really sweet support whenever i would be open about going through a tough time online um so why not right <laughs> Yeah, I really want to thank you as well, because I feel like there are definitely certain topics that are very sensitive for some people. And I think having voices like yours talk about them kind of normalizes bringing up these conversations. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Th thank you for saying that, because it does, that does mean a lot to me. And especially because, you know, because of the crunch culture and everything in the games industry being so prevalent, it's there's really like a disproportionate amount of people suffering from the same problems, I think, at least in terms of mental health. Yeah, I think anxiety is one of the most common issues in the world. You know, like I see a therapist, I've been seeing a therapist for it, and sometimes she gives me this, like, these little nuggets of wisdom. And I'm like, I'll, I'll post them, you know, like something that my therapist said or whatever, you know, or, or, and I'll post it because I know that maybe not everyone has access to a good psychologist, you know? So I'm like, I, I can share that because I, I'm, um, you know, I'm not afraid to share it. So maybe if, if somebody reads something that I say and feels less alone or, um, you know, or, or I post something that works for me, uh, then great, you know? And if, if nobody reads it, that's fine too. Maybe it's that 
famous Dutch straightforwardness <laughs> that allows you to be so fearless. I, I think, you know, it's, it's funny that you say that because I do think, I do think there's truth to it. But, but like mental health is not something that's really discussed in, in Dutch culture at all. And I think... No, of course. <laughs> but I, I do feel, yeah, I mean, the Dutch are way too like, um, you know, there's even a Dutch saying, do maar normaal, do je gek, ben je gek genoeg? And it means be normal, that's crazy enough. And I grew up in that with an anxiety disorder. So it was kind of... Um, you know, not really, uh, I couldn't absolutely not talk about it. Uh, but I do have the Dutch, like, I'm very straightforward. I really, uh, I'm not harsh at all, but I'm really straightforward and I don't really have a filter. And there's not really a separation between my personal life, my work life, you know, there's in terms of character, obviously, you know, like I don't bring my personal stuff to work, but like I'm the same person consistently, very annoyingly. And um, so if you ask me, you know, even at work, like I have a reputation, if people ask me, hey, how are you doing now? Because I wasn't used to that question. You don't have, you don't ask that question in Holland uh, as casually as you do in North American culture. Like, hey, how are you? You know, it's like just a greeting here. But I will just be like, well, today is shit. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'll, and I'll tell you why if you ask. And I have no filter. So, um, so I think it's, you know, I used to actually really try to put a more of a filter on myself to, to cultivate, I don't know, maybe a more professional image or a stronger image. And I was like, hell no, <laughs> you know, I don't need to do that. I mean, obviously like there's a time and place for everything in terms of subjects, you know, when I'm at work, I'm working, but, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, felt ve I feel very strong. I mean, it's like you said, I'm fearless when it comes to speaking up about these subjects, you know, and really tough subjects, but, I'm fearless with an anxiety disorder. <laughs> so, but I'm like a walking paradox. <laughs> we really appreciate that, that you have that honesty and that that's something that you're trying to spread, I think, in, in the industry overall, that, you know, advocating for people to take care of themselves and having that support network if they can. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I hope. I, I see a few very strong voices on social media in, in the games industry where a lot of people are very open about uh, mental health and physical health and taking care. And I think it's very inspiring when I, you know, it helps me when I read about that. Like, and I always try to, you know, I, I always try to be constructive, you know, um, I'm not using, I'm not using social media as, as just, you know, to vent even though it does help, I, I always try to post like, okay, this is tough. Um, you know, how, how am I going to deal with it? Like how to move forward, you know? Um, but I also like, I don't, like I, I follow people in the games industry who do vent, you know, their, their issues and in a way that can help others too, you know, feel less alone. So yeah, I just feel like it's, it's, it should be a safe, safe thing to do, you know, as long as you're not harming others, because like people can't handle these subjects. They don't have to follow you. Um, but yeah, personally, my, my own approach is that if I do post about these things, I try to do it in a way that's like, okay. Um, you know, like I said, I like, okay, I feel like this, this is worth sharing. Or, um, you know, and in the past, it has also helped me like, okay, if I would go for, for, you know, like a biopsy or not a medical test and I was scared, I would share that I'm scared. And, and, you know, it's like people would send me digital hugs and I know it's like an easy thing to do, but it still made me feel better. So why not? I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today, but <laughs> thank you very much for talking to us and for your work on, you. on Assassin's Creed over the years. Thank you, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not on Assassin's Creed anymore since February. I work on a different project, but I do, you know, it's close to my heart and I'm still like very much following everything that's happening. I have good friends working on Assassin's Creed and, you know, I don't know, who knows, maybe I'll work on it again one day, I don't know. But if not, I'll be enjoying it as a fan again as well which will be nice i'm just gonna try to avoid the spoilers you know so but yeah thank you so much for having me it was a real pleasure i really hope 
again, like I was saying earlier, I just wish we could have like these live events any, you know, one day, I know. <laughs> just hang out in person, you know, but yeah, one step at a time, one vaccine at a time. Thank you, Laurie, as well. I'm happy to be here. Join us again next time on AC Sisterhood Speaks and have a good week.